four-part Latino lecture series um, with two of my favorite people, two folks who are the best in the biz when it comes to understanding the Latino political landscape. And, you know, this series is about understanding the multiple dimensions and layers of Latinos, the political dimension, the cultural dimension. But I did want to start this series off with the 2020 election. Um, there were many milestones in this election in general, but for the Latino community uh, in 2020 at 32 million, Latinos became the largest minority voting bloc in the country. And just to give you a sense of perspective, 50 years ago, Latinos made up less than 5% of the American population. Today, we make up close to 20%. And when you look at states such as my home state of Texas, Latinos later this year, in just about six months, will officially become the largest group in the state. And this is something that is generalized across the country with the fastest rates of growth in the South, in the Midwest. Uh, one of my favorite fun factoids is that South Dakota has the fastest rate of growth for Latinos in the whole country. And with this growth comes political voice. And we have been seeing that political voice increase over the last couple of decades. However, as we'll discuss today, this voice is very diverse and it's very complex. Latinos are black, Latinos are white, Latinos are Asian. There are Latinos for whom the border crossed them and there are Latinos who just recently arrived. There are Latinos who love Donald Trump others who adored Theo Bernie, and Latinos who were juntos con Biden all the way. And to dig into this nuance and fascinating landscape, I have with me Daniela Pierre Bravo and Matt Barreto. Matt Barreto, he's an old grad school buddy of mine, so I can't say Dr. Matt Barreto, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds too formal, I'm like Matt. Oh, no. <laughs> Matt is a professor at UCLA and the co-founder of the research and polling firm LD Insights, Time Magazine named Matt, Matt's work and his polling firm, the gold standard in Latino American polling. And Matt and his team just recently wrapped up polling for the Biden campaign and the folks and organization Matt has worked with are the who's who of the political landscape. Daniela is a producer for MSNBC's Morning Joe and a contributing writer and millennial ambassador to NBC's News Know Your Value platform. She is also the co-author of Earn It with Mika Brzezinski. And what Daniela brings is this incredible perspective of hearing Latino voices, but also the voices of millennials and bringing that to life, illustrating what is behind the numbers and the headlines. And regrettably, Dr. Gerald Cadava, who was set to join us for this conversation, is ill but fortunately, it is not COVID-19, it's the old fashioned flu, um, but we hope to have them join us soon at, uh, at one of our events. And in the meantime, I'll point y'all to his most recent work, an op-ed that came out in the New York Times from yesterday, where he talks about the phenomena of the Hispanic Republican, especially in the context of the 2020 election. So with that very long introduction, I wanna get started and I wanna get started with you, Matt, to lay the groundwork for us in terms of what are the broad brushstrokes that we saw in the 2020 election. But before I do so, I do want to shout out your new polling firm, congratulate you on the founding of a new minority owned uh, firm, LD Insights. So with that, Matt, congratulations, bienvenido and take it away. Thank you, thank you, Vicky, uh, and thanks. Uh, you know, 2021, it's a, a new start for us and Gary Segura, who you know. Um, we're excited to be out on our own as a 100% Latino-owned and operated uh, polling firm. We had uh, been in partnership before at Latino Decisions, but now we're we're officially out on our own and very excited about what the new year brings. So thanks for that. Um, I will say thanks. You know, just to start for the invitation. As uh, you can all see, I'm here looking like my COVID self. I haven't shaved in a while. I've got my Hawaiian shirt. And so of course, Vicky and Daniela are always looking their best and um, no surprises there. It's great to be here on camera with both of you. 
Um, so what did we learn in 2020? Well, I think you were getting us started with some of the big highlights, which were the numbers, the big numbers that we saw in 2020. We're estimating through our analysis of precinct data, of early vote, voter file data, which we were tracking every day, all of that massive early vote. And then some of the states have already reported their voter file that we're estimating about 16.6 million. Now it could exceed that when we get all of the data, but 16.6 million Latino votes cast. Let me put that into perspective. It was a big year all around. And you know, uh, in Texas had a huge turnout this year compared to other years. The overall American electorate grew by 15%. It was one of the largest four-year increases we had ever seen, 15%. But the Latino vote, it grew by 31%, over double what the American electorate grew. So it wasn't just part of this increase that everyone's experiencing. Something happened more, about twice as much in the Latino community. And that happened across uh, virtually every single state. We saw massive increases in that turnout. And so I want to make sure that as people think about the Latino vote, when they think about where did the percentages go up or down or where did where their inroads across the board, the vote is growing massively. That's going to continue. It's being driven by two factors. The first is young people. The Latino community is overwhelmingly young, over 10 years on average younger than white non-Hispanics. And the population of voters is extremely young. The largest increases that we saw we're in that 18 to 29 crowd. That is growing the electorate, but there's still much more room to grow. And so while there was the biggest growth there, those younger folks, 18 to about 35, they also had the lowest turnout rate. Latinos who are 40, 50, 60 are turning out at higher rates. There's just fewer of them. And so I see that as both a great accomplishment, but opportunity, meaning we grew this electorate by 4 million largely probably over half, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's over half of the growth is just from young people. But we could do so much more. We could probably add another 6 million votes by the next election, 6 million by the next election. We could be up over 22, 23 million Latino voters. That would transform. You're talking about changing Texas, uh, solidifying Arizona, uh, changing states in the, in the South, you mentioned, North Carolina and Georgia. So that voter growth, I think, is the biggest headline. I know we're going to talk about what happened with, with Trump and what happened in Miami and different places. The, the exciting news from my perspective as someone who worked on the Biden campaign of Arizona, uh, I thought you were going to say, I guess, your other uh, home state. I know you are a Texan now, but I know that uh, I'm a Arizona, Texan by marriage. Uh, <laughs> I think that was in your uh, prenup, wasn't it? That you are now a Texan, you were required. Uh, mm -hmm. But I know you're also an Arizonan. Um, and Arizona was so exciting this year with what happened there. And so there's a lot to talk about in terms of the, the, the numbers in the different states, the support for Biden or Trump and what happened down ballot, the support for some of the Senate candidates. Um, but the vote growth numbers, I just want everyone to take a minute and think about. They were massive. They were massive, especially in the state of Texas. It was one of the states with the largest, uh, most rapid growth of the turnout. And just to say one thing about Texas, and um, just as an opening comment, some people thought, well, what happened in Texas? It, it didn't quite go as blue as we had thought. I think the 2018 Senate election was the outlier, if you look at the larger trend in Texas. It gave people a little bit too much hope. That was really an election about a Texas, uh, two Texans, um, and Beto O'Rourke was a very good Texas candidate who campaigned very hard in Texas. If you take that and set it aside, Texas went from Romney winning in 12 by 16, Trump winning by nine, in, in, in 16, excuse me, Romney in 12, Trump won only by nine. So it dropped seven points. This year, Trump won by five and a half, five. dropped another mm -hmm. three, three points. So three and a half points. Texas is going from 16 to nine to five and a half. It could be two points next year if just we do nothing but let the demographics continue. So Texas is going to be exciting. It's the, the Latino population is growing it dramatically. Um, and that's one thing I'm, I'm following and watching very closely. And shameless plug for our second series, uh, second episode, we're gonna be doing a deep dive into Texas and exactly that and really looking at the different regions within Texas, but it's gonna be a cliffhanger. You're gonna have to tune in <laughs> for that deeper dive because I, I really, I, I need to unpack Florida. And Daniela, I'm looking at you for this because I know that 
you talk to a lot of folks across Florida. Florida is always interesting when it comes to presidential elections, but especially this time around with regards to Latinos. I was thinking back to election night where uh, in Florida, we were starting to see the first returns and it was eye popping to everyone, the margins of you know, Cuban voters in, in Miami-Dade and what those numbers look like. And it looked like this Trump love fest. And then folks started talking about that it was all over Florida, but there's just so much hidden within kind of those top line numbers. So Daniela, what's going on? Yeah, and I first wanna say thank you for having me. And it's so funny because I am used to wrangling you two to wake up early for us. So it's so good to be here. Um, yeah, Florida is such a crazy micro my kind of place in itself. And I think that's why I sort of wanted to dive in when I was doing these pieces for Morning Joe. It was really important for me to understand sort of the other side. And I think that a lot of the more conservative voices sort of get buried, A, because unless you're, you're a Cuban American, you're not yelling from the rooftops that you're voting for Trump, right? And so you have to really go in and dig and find those voters. But um, I remember the first piece I did, I put together this sort of focus group um, specifically in Miami, South Florida on uh, Trump, Trump voters or would be Trump voters. And you know there was Cuban Americans, Nicaraguans, uh, Colombians, Puerto Ricans, Venezuelans. And, you know, by and large, a lot of them sort of felt like, first of all, Trump had been there on the ground, really asking for their vote. They didn't see a lot of, of um, sort of Biden ground game there. Um, so that was something that I think that overall, from the Latinos that I spoke to in Florida, they didn't the Biden campaign just didn't didn't connect as well um, the messaging uh, from the Trump campaign, and the other thing is sort of this anti-socialism sentiment. I mean that was very well received with Cuban Americans in South Florida, uh, Venezuelans, Colombians, and um, you know even some of of um, the Puerto Ricans who who I spoke to, the small business owners who who were now on the mainland. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, post Hurricane Maria and the sort of rhetoric that Trump had and, and maybe the fact that he didn't give as much aid uh, to the island. And, you know, they said, well, our government is corrupt anyway. So even if he did send the funds, we probably it wasn't probably distributed correctly. And so that was one of the main things from the Puerto Ricans that were new to to the eye or new to the mainland that I found really really was something that they used to support Trump. But then the other thing that I found also that I dug into was um, the Puerto Ricans who were new to the mainland after Hurricane Maria. And I spoke to Chuck, Chuck Roca um, about this, who has done a lot of work specifically in Florida um, and, and to you, Matt, as well. So you can sort of jump in here when you want. But, you know, there is a lot of Puerto Ricans who were up for grabs that had no party affiliation. And I think um, between what who, the, the voters that I spoke to, they cited a lot of misinformation yeah. that they heard in um, from from the Trump campaign campaign about Biden. And a lot of what I heard, too, was that you know, a lot of people say, well, well, Trump talks disparagingly about immigrants and, and they, he talks, um, you know, when it comes to immigration, he's, he, he's, he, he doesn't have a heart. And so when I, I remember speaking to the Cuban Americans um, and the Colombians in, in the focus group that we had, and I held up the photo of the son and the father who had drowned on their way to, to the U.S., um, and I said, what do, you, what do you think of this? And impulsively, one of the Cuban Americans that I spoke to said, well, this wouldn't have happened if they would have came here legally. Um, so I almost think you know, there is a sense of whenever Trump talks disparagingly about Latinos or immigrants, there is this mm -hmm. idea of saying, well, that's not, he's not talking about me. He's talking about another Latino. So they, they were able to sort of separate themselves in a very distinct way as a different kind of immigrant. So, and I, I, I haven't heard a lot about this, but 
yet reported, but I feel like it's it's um, important to dig into sort of our own internalization within the Latino community and our sense of identity with one another, because there is a sense of good bad, good immigrant versus bad immigrant. And I think that that's one of the, the reasons why Trump was able to make inroads with this specific sort of Cuban American population in a way where he could get away with the disparaging comments on immigrants because there was a sort of distancing um, from Latino to Latino. You know, in, in, in that point, Daniela, about the, the otherizing of immigrants, even though technically all of these Cuban Americans, Venezolanos, Nicaragüenses are immigrants themselves, but it's the shade of under what auspices they came, especially as you were pointing out, the socialism rhetoric really took hold in Florida. And, you know, we know that the Trump campaign was on the ground in South Florida doing Spanish language outreach in 2019. So a full year before. So you can see where this starts to take a hold. And the issue of immigration is, is so puzzling at, at times for us. And, and, and Matt, I'm gonna to turn to you to, to unpack this because on the one hand, immigration is important for the Latino community, but on the other hand, it's not the most important issue. You know, Latinos care about the economy. We care about the things that other folks care about. So if, if you can maybe zoom out and talk to us about the spectrum of issues that were grabbing Latinos, and in addition, how immigration was playing in the data you were seeing. Yeah, I think, first of all, just following up on the really excellent point that Daniela made about the heterogeneity within the Latino uh, view towards um, immigrants and the Trump rhetoric, there's almost no one who, when you ask them either in a focus group or in an internet survey or a telephone survey, any, who, who's against immigrants, right? And so I think sometimes we see that very high level of support of the immigrant experience, and we overinterpret that to mean that they're going to solely, single-handedly reject uh, the Trump rhetoric. But what we found was that, you know, there is that heterogeneity there. And some people, when they heard the four years of the Trump rhetoric, they became more anti-Trump and more pro-immigrant. We're seeing that in the data. This was a real big divide within the Latino community. And then other people started to let it sort of roll off of their back, saying, well, he isn't talking about me. Some of the exact quotes that Daniela heard in her, her focus groups. You know, yes, I get that. It's annoying. We would hear a lot. I wish he wouldn't say it, but he's not talking about me. And so they were mm -hmm. able to justify that and almost that it, it normalize it in a sense, okay? Others were not though. We saw on the other side, people continually protesting, you know, the kids in cages, the comments about the Central American caravan in the 2018 midterms. So we really saw that split in the Latino community uh, sort of emerge. And I don't think that there was a large group that was anti-immigrant. It's just that they weren't as, as bothered, let's say by the Trump rhetoric or would say things like, well, if they did it the right way. The other thing is what you just mentioned, that there are other issues on the agenda. And so while the immigration issue oftentimes tugs at our heart, is symbolic, um, what happened this year was, and we learned this in sort of unpacking Florida and other states, how we responded to COVID and the economy uh, really took center stage. I mean, people were really struggling in the Latino community, in the immigrant community. And while they may have been bothered by some of those statements, they really wanted to get their store back open. They wanted to get their family business back up or they wanted to get mom and dad back to work. And so while we thought that we had a very effective message that looked good and people trusted science and wear your mask and um, let's take this seriously, there was also an undercurrent for some who said my single biggest priority is just getting the economy back open. And one of the things that Trump was good at was just screaming the same thing over and over again. His, his messages were never that complex. <laughs> And so he became associated with getting the economy back open. And we became associated with some folks, because again, overall, I think we did okay with let's just wait and see, let's let science. And so we had these really interesting, you know, sort of findings in the data and, and we still need to unpack them where people would agree with both sides. They would say, absolutely, scientists should be in charge. Trump is not doing a good job of listening to scientists. I'm worried about this disease spreading, but I need the economy open. I need to get back to work. I need to get my kids to school. And so we heard the first part maybe too much. Oh, they like our message on science. They like our message on being safe. They don't want to spread the disease. And let's just keep saying that. 
what Trump was doing the whole time, especially in Florida, was just hammering on the economy. And so, again, it, it's not that that was for 100 percent, but there was that segment. If you're talking about this fluctuation of the, the 10 points we lost there um, or the 15 points in some places, I do think that part of it was due to that. And so we're trying to understand and unpack ways to make sure that when you have those discussions, you're leading with that understanding and that more populist message of we understand what you're going through and, and how can we address that. That's not going to change the fact that I think Democrats or, or um, others are going to say, but listen, we're going to do this right and we're going to let science guide us. So we're never going to move off of that core message, but I do think that there's a better way to possibly discuss you know, these issues and, and hopefully COVID will go away, but the economy will not. It will always be a message and something we need to communicate on. All right, so I promised to get off Florida, but but one one last comment on Florida is, and, and this is completely anecdotal, it is not scientific at all. It goes to me watching Telemundo and Univision and that I, I saw a lot of negative ads. And so Daniela, when you were talking about the misinformation and those, those, those strong negative campaigns on the ground, I was also seeing them reflected. I saw some Biden ads and they were positive, but we know that negative ads and the and the and the research is mixed here can be very powerful as well. So I think that that you know it was it was a combination of things. There was no silver bullet for understanding what happened in Florida, but it was this combination of things. All right, I'm putting Florida to the side because it, there's a whole bunch more of the country, and and I really want to get into that youth piece that you brought up. Matt, in terms of just look at the sheer size, and this is something, Daniela, that you look at closely, looking at millennials in particular, and, and now we're starting to also think about Gen, Gen Z when we're looking at the political landscape. And, and so talk to us about where they sp stand politically, what their voice looks like, and also about the intergenerational dynamics, because these are Gen Zers and millennials living with multi-generational households with Gen X parents and with abuelas and abuelos who are baby boomers. Yeah, I have so much to say about this. Um, but even, even in, this is the last point that I'm gonna say about Cuban Americans in Florida, but even um, the younger Cuban Americans in Florida um, in, in, in sort of the South Florida area, they're even becoming a little bit more moderate and more to the left than, than their family. I just wanted to say that. But also I, I just have to say, when we talk about millennials we have to understand the power of Gen Zers as well. I mean, I think that we haven't fully understood the data of this generation. And I'm talking about Gen Z. I mean, this is a generation who, you know, is this election cycle was one of the first times that th they voted. Um, this is a generation who, whose sort of sense of identity and belonging has been, has been defined in these last four years, right? The Black Lives Movement was something that is, something that is ingrained um, into their coming of age, right? They have seen no matter, you know, their background, the consequences of the lack of gun reform, um, they've seen the rhetoric, policy and politics is so ingrained in their sense of identity and belonging. And, you know, we, when we look at millennials and Gen Zers, like it is one of the most diverse um, uh, segments of the population out there. So when you're talking about specifically Latinos, um, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of um, Gen Zers and millennials when I when I was doing these pieces. Um, and, you know, even in, in Texas, um, I, I was talking to a, a young woman who's Whose, uh, whose grandparents and family members were uh, Mexican Americans, and she was the only Democrat in her family, and she, fe you know, she felt the push and pull um, of that, um, but slowly did her trying to convince her family about all of the policies and told me about them sort of misinformation in the WhatsApp groups and the Facebooks that she was sort of encountering within her family. But I, one story um, that I found really interesting um, is from Ohio, because I wanted to know more about Latinos in Ohio. Um, it's, I grew up in Ohio and 
just to give you an idea, I'm a DACA recipient. I grew up in the shadows in Jim Jordan district. So that was my upbringing, um, just to give you a sense. So I knew that if the Latinos in Ohio were in places where it was sort of um, white communities, they weren't gonna be really verbal about what their political views are. So I wanted to sort of tap in and dig in there. And I spoke to a family in um, who lived in the suburbs of Columbus who were Mexican American, both parents had voted um, had, had voted uh, Republican and whose daughter, this was the first time that she was um, voting in the election. Um, and she was a strong Bernie supporter. She was like a total Bernie fan and um, made her mom like drive the three hours to, to go to a, a rally in Cleveland, which he didn't end up showing up at. But anyways, there, um, I know three hours to get there and he's not there. But um, the we were talking. I was talking with the mom, and and I was telling her, well, what do you what do you think about these comments? I mean, what about the comments against um, Mexican Americans? Um, and she she was telling me that she was at her last straw, and that converse you know having conversations with her daughter was educating her more than any sort of other way that she was getting her information from. And so you can see the sort of mobilizing and activating of this young um, demographic, whether it's Gen Zers and millennials within their households. And they're doing the sort of work on educating their family members and telling the stories of um, that are sort of getting lost in these WhatsApp groups and these Facebook um, uh, groups. So I just found it interesting that we're seeing this sort of mobilization and activism right in in the homes of kind of uh, multi-generational households. It, and I, I see Matt just going amen to that because we know that in immigrant communities, um, you don't tend to see the level of political participation that you do in non-immigrant communities because we're just not socialized. You know, we didn't grow up going to the polls with our parents or with our grandparents. So, so in having these really active and politicized Gen Zers and millennials pull their parents in, that boosts up political participation. And then at the same time, it, it shaves the edge off, the conservative edge off, what we tend to see with more recent immigrants who tend to be a little bit more conservative on religious purposes, on moral purposes, and you start to see that. So I mean, this phenomenon, Daniela, is incredible. And I think it's just a whole new chapter in how we understand Latino politics. All right, it's already 6.30 and there's like 15 more things I wanna to get to. All right, but but I do wanna to get to my, my, my native home state where I was born and raised, Arizona, and, and talk about the flip side. So we started off talking about Florida and, and the really powerful mobilizing support Trump and the GOP had down there, but we saw an opposite phenomena in Arizona. And Matt, I know you and your team did a ton of work down there. Can you talk to us about um, the Grand Canyon State? And we can throw yeah. Nevada in there too, in the Southwest in general. No, let's let's definitely talk about Arizona because it was a, a shining spot. It started uh, 10 years ago with SB 1070 and the organizing that uh, people on the ground were doing. Um, all of the civic groups, many of these driven by young people, uh, by other DACA recipients uh, or people who were in those networks, they started organizing in Arizona when the population was getting large and the political representation wasn't there yet. And you had Joe Arpaio, you had Jan Brewer. And so Arizona has been transforming behind the scenes in many of the same ways that California was uh, in the 1990s because of those ballot initiatives and Pete Wilson. So we saw that happening. There was a lot of push. We saw Joe Arpaio lose an election. We saw Russell Pierce, the author of SB 1070 recalled from office. Uh, and there were these little changes. We saw um, Adrian Fontes, a uh, Mexican-American elected to the county clerk of uh, Maricopa. And then we saw the big change happen in 2018 when the Senate seat went for Kristen Sinema. That was almost entirely driven, that 2018 midterm, that huge turnout. Again, it started with a lot of young Latino participation in that election and exceeding uh, Democratic vote uh, share totals that had not been there before. That just continued. So we built on that. Uh, we had Latino organizers on the Biden campaign uh, in, in Arizona. We had the, the state director 
was a Latina. We had a Latino state uh, organizer um, and we were doing lots of research and outreach. And we were trying to meet Latinos where they, where they were, where there were opportunities to improve and have those discussions with more acculturated second, third, fourth generation. Uh, we were having different types of discussions. And I think the Arizona model, the more people learn about it, will really become a blueprint for how you have multiple types. We had a totally different program geared at younger Gen Z uh, Latinos that was entirely digital, um, that was using humor and other ways to get people to the polls. And we saw the results. Uh, there was a, a very, very large turnout, over 150,000 extra Latino votes cast uh, in this election. Uh, the turnout increase in Arizona was phenomenal. And that accounted for the margin of victory. I mean, when you looked at the results, when you look at how close it was, if we had not had that growth, just that growth of all those extra requests to turn out the vote, that is what uh, turned out uh, and turned Arizona. And that's going to continue. You know, Arizona is not static. That's not something that just, wow, there was good mobilizing. This is, as I said, it's been going for 10 years and it's going to continue. The groups that are there, uh, Lucha and the uh, groups on the ground in Arizona are amazing. And so keep your eye on that. We now have you know, two Democratic U.S. senators, a Democratic presidential win in Arizona. And look at the entire you know, sort of Southwest region now. You have two Democratic senators from Arizona, from Nevada, from Colorado, from California. Texas is going to be close. Uh, and uh, th that entire region, that whole uh, part of the country uh, where the border crossed people, um, that is now ha has transformed over the last 20 years, Nevada and other states, New Mexico. When we started studying, uh, Vicki, just sort of in, in full disclosure, Vicki and I have a, an academic paper we wrote many years ago about the 2000 uh, presidential election and the rise of outreach to Latinos way back in 2000, that's when New Mexico was flipping and New Mexico was yeah. a battleground state. So that whole Southwest, I think Arizona is sort of the cherry on top for me as a democratic organizer and researcher, but it really shows what happens when you invest and you, you show up and the Latino community is going to continue transforming, I think, uh, the Southwest. And, and one of these protagonists that, that you brought up, Matt, um, are DACA recipients. And, you know, the irony being that DACA recipients can't vote, you know, and, and God willing, something happens in the next couple of years where we see a path to citizenship. But Daniela, can, can you talk to us a little bit about Arizona, the DACA organizing within the state, but also more generally, and how that has been an incredibly powerful Gen Z and millennial force? Yeah, I think in the ways that, for example, in Florida, the anti-immigrant sentiment sort of was brushed off. It acted as a mobilizer, as an activator for the community um, in Arizona. And I mean, it went straight to the, the populations that had most at stake in this, right? Um, and, and, and also, you know, not only DACA recipients, but I actually spoke to um, an organizer in, in Nevada and they were saying how this is such kind of a, an untold story in the level of impact that DACA recipients had. And not only that, but DACA recipients were actually um, bringing in their undocumented family to go in and get people to reg register to vote um, and educated on the process, right? And so we see where these communities, you know, have so much at stake especially obviously DACA recipients where we've in within the, these last four years, we've rescinded the program. It's gone to the Supreme Court. It, you know, it's sort of backtracked a little bit. And so you see specifically in Arizona when there is so much at stake, you know, these communities have sort of come out in, in a very brave way. I mean, when I heard that DACA recipients were um, bringing in their family members to have to go out and mobilize people to vote, it's just incredible. But it, it goes to show the level of energy that there is in a state like Arizona. You know, and, and think about that, right? Where you're 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 putting yourself on the line, yeah. and, and then you're putting folks who don't even have the DACA protections in the midst of an administration that did away with priority enforcement where anyone is game for ICE to come and get you. So, I mean, I think that just underscores how angry the community was and, and anger is one of the most you know, potent political mobilizers. And, and we saw that case in point in Arizona. 
we're starting to get a lot of questions and I promised folks that we would get to questions. So I'm gonna start pulling some questions and some comments, but then and we're gonna take the last five minutes of the hour to come back and do a little crystal balling. I, I wanna to talk to the both of you about where we see 2022 and 2024 with regards to our you know, political dynamics and the, and the Latino electorate. So let me start, okay. Uh, I'm going up to the top. I wanna to be orderly here. So this is from Nicole Herrera Moro. And Daniela, she asks you to expand more on the idea of being a different type of immigrant. Um, that this person, Nicole, said that she noticed that a lot of Latinos that voted for Trump were white Latinos, phenotypically white. Is there any correlation that you observed to race and uh, superiority complex that may feel in saying that they are a different type of immigrant? One of the things that I found, um, and I think this this came from Eki, so I was talking to Stephanie about this, and I believe it was Wisconsin where, you know, there was such a, a, a gender gap um, and this idea of, you know, women who tended to work in more immigrant-based communities, whereas men, and, and leaned more Democrat, whereas the men who worked in white communities tended to um, vote Republican. And so I do think that there is this theme of how close to whiteness are you American, mm -hmm. American whiteness you are and how that uh, sort of impacts your, you know, how you're going to vote. And I, I, I specifically thought about this when I spoke to the Latinos in um, the outskirts of Columbus and, and Cleveland, right? So these are predominantly white suburban areas. Um, and then Latin, the Latinos that I spoke to were, you know, Republicans um, thinking about voting for Trump. And so that that's important. I also think, you know, the level of detachment from the immigrant experience that you have. So first generation versus second, third and fourth, you know, you mm -hmm. might, you know, immigration might not be, you know, one, two or three of the most important issues. But on that end, I just have to say something about um, Bernie um, and the way that Chuck, who is the person behind leading his Latino effort, did a really good job, I think, of using Bernie's Latino background, I'm not, not Latino background, immigrant background to sort of connect with voters bring them in and then start talking about healthcare and the economy. So using immigration as sort of this like connector, like this emotional connector to sort of explain what the agenda was going to be. But I do think that, um, again, there's, there's a certain sense of how assimilated are you and how close to white culture are you? And I think that you know, data and, and the people that I spoke to certainly show that, you know, the more kind of engrossed you are within white communities, the more likely you, you'll, you'll be to, to sort of lean a little bit more right than you would left. Mm. So we have a question here about Georgia and we're what, two weeks, three weeks off of Georgia, I don't even know. Uh, did you, Matt, do any work in Georgia? Were you doing any polling? What were you seeing in terms of the electorate and the runoff as well? Uh, yeah, definitely. We, we were doing um, work all the way through on Georgia. It's one of the uh, fastest growing Latino electorates. Um, it was an electorate that is extremely young and high propensity of folks are first time voters. Um, overall nationally about maybe 20% in this election, one in five, it was their first time ever voting. In Georgia, that was closer to one in three Latinos. It was their first election ever voting. And so there was a need for extra mobilization, extra outreach, uh, just explaining the issues of the candidates. There was a huge challenge with making sure that people understood about the runoff election, how to vote, when to vote. Many people thought they had already voted because they had just voted in the US Senate election on November 3rd. That was on the ballot. It was now on the ballot again. And so just explaining all of that and the need for outreach, we can't take for granted um, just this sort of newness of the experience. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Vicky, that you know people don't have those same stories that come from their grandparents to their parents. So many people, it is their first election and they are possibly the children of immigrants who don't, aren't eligible to vote. So Georgia really um, encapsulates that. There's also huge opportunity for growth in Georgia. Um, Georgia uh, is underperforming as good as it did 
And I think it's going to get there. I think the Latino vote is going to get there, but it is still a very low registration and a very low turnout state. It is one that has had an, um, a big amount of work in the last four years. Really before that, when you know Georgia wasn't that competitive, th there wasn't a lot of organizing there. So sometimes it takes that, getting it on the map. I would expect that to continue and for Georgia to continue growing in that direction. But um, th there's probably as many Latino voters in Georgia who did not vote in this election that did, and an additional as many not even registered yet who are eligible to register. So we really need to do voter registration, voter turnout in places like Georgia to get to our full potential. We're starting to see that in the state we just talked about, Arizona, is actually now has a pretty high registration rate. But some of those other new states, North Carolina is in that bucket too. Uh, I really wish we could continue a year round investment in those states. And it's unfortunate that it takes, you know, um, getting on the political map uh, for people to start caring about the community, which has been there for a long time. But I do think it's here to stay now. I think the Latino vote in Georgia is one we'll continue talking about. And, and the rest of the South, Matt, you know, I know we've, we've talked about this. I, you know, I lived in North Carolina for a number of years. I saw the Latino population, you know, explode in front of my eyes. So I think it's North Carolina going to be Tennessee. It's going to be all of these states that were previously part of the Deep South, rigid black-white dynamic, but now you have this, you know, multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural landscape. And talking about multis and the, and, and the dimensions, a biggie here, and we have several questions, is about religion. Uh, we have one from Rosa who says, please address um, conservatism and how this is one issue that makes Latinos vote R. My uh, colleague, Angela Valenzuela, says, what role does religion play? I understand that some research that Catholics tend to vote Democrat, Protestants Republican. Could this also be related to the concept of proximity to whiteness? There's a lot there. Um, Daniela, I'm going to let you jump in first. And then Matt, also, if you could help us unpack this, the, the religious dynamic. Yeah, I think Matt might have a bit more on the data here, but I just just anecdotally, by and large, I think I heard even um, Latinos who were on the fence about voting for Trump, um, certainly conservative Latinos who were on the fence, um, you know, his supposed stance uh, that was against abortion and his appointment of conservative judges was something that I heard was was a was a major draw to his candidacy, even though they might not have been super super thrilled about his rhetoric and all of the other stuff that um, kind of got in the way. But, but certainly, I think conservative, conservatism in the religion, and particularly, and again, um, among Mexican Americans, um, the reasons why they, they cited that they were going to vote for Trump was because of um, religious reasons. And again, that sort of stance, very anti-abortion, conservative mm -hmm. judge appointment. I would just right, well, add to that, that yeah. um, it's really a Republican uh, strategy that they've been effective at. I don't think it's a Trump uh, strategy at all. I, I think we saw that happen in the, in the George W. Bush years, that he talked about his own personal uh, religiosity, that people were able to actually directly relate to him if they were also uh, had born again experience or, or were uh, devout uh, Christians. And then the Republican Party, I think, learned from that, and they could find some ways to make inroads. Obama was able to go, I think, through that, also portraying himself as a, a religious uh, individual and, and make connections with Latinos through that. What happened in the last four years, I do, I do think religion was a part of the story, but it's not Trump himself. Trump does not have any of the characteristics of a religious person. Uh, his own uh, individual life. I mean, he has hardly uh, been associated with going to church. Is um, you know the the sort of morality that surrounds his multiple marriages and mistresses and casinos that he owns and the sort of shady uh, folks that he hangs out with. That was that th that is a hard sell. Uh, but I do think that the Republican Party overall made a very organized pitch this year. Uh, on those issues. And so that certainly is something that we need to unpack and understand. Typically, we do think about that as candidate centered, that the mm -hmm. candidate themselves has those characteristics, but that certainly was not the case this year with Trump. Um, and I mean, you would be hard pressed to get a person who is actually very religious 
to say that they like Trump because of um, you know religion and, and morality and these sorts of reasons. Um, but the party as a whole is, is making that a play and that's something we should continue to understand. And on the point of Catholicism, go just ahead, Danielle. Point, I think a lot of Latinos that are conservative just cannot get behind somebody that it's, I think it's more about like not being able to get behind a candidate that is pro-life. Uh, pro um, I, I think that that's one of the biggest things um, among conservative Latinos. It's more about yeah. that than, than it, and it's exactly about what Matt said about, it's not that Trump is like the picture of morality, but it's, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, the narrative that they tell themselves because they just can't get through that pro-life stance on the left. Yeah, that's, all right. The questions are coming at me fast and furious. Uh, let, me, let me grab this one because I know that this was a very popular theme. Um, this is from Joseph Flores, a student of mine. Uh, I didn't force them to come. So Joseph, thank you for coming. Talk to us about the macho aspect of Trump's campaign um, and how I think on the flip side, how we saw such strong Latina support for Biden. So maybe Matt and Danielle, if you could parse that out. Yeah, I'll say just a few uh, things. Uh, first of all, I think that understanding the gender gap this year is one that we need to look at both uh, genders and not just uh, look at what was happening with uh, Latino men. What created the gap was that uh, women, Latinas, were increasing and have been steadily increasing their support for Democratic candidates. It was very high in the Clinton election. Uh, it has continued to follow in, in that direction. And so uh, Latinas are increasing uh, and men possibly were falling off this year, but even if they had maintained, that gap still would have been present. It still would have been there. It has been there for a long time. There has been a gender gap, but I do think it is growing. And a, a, a large part of it is uh, women uh, voting more democratic. So then the question is what's happening with men. I think the machismo is potentially part of it, but I think it's part of a larger package of political correctness uh, and that mm. sort of um, anti-establishment that Trump stood for. There was a little bit of it in Bernie Sanders as well, right? Uh, he had a sort of tell it to you straight and anti-establishment that you could still see the quote unquote Bernie bros sort of gravitating toward, but the, no one would uh, accuse him of, of being, you know, machismo, of being sexist Bernie, that is, right? So uh, that's why I don't think all of it that has been chalked up, I, I think that's too simple to say that that's why Trump, it's possibly part of it, but I think it's more of this, the straight giving. And what does that tell us? People like to hear direct talk. They want to hear exactly what the politician is going to do. They don't want to hear all of these you know, uh, overly buzzword laden uh, statements. And so Trump was able to cut through that. And I think that uh, he was able to make some inroads, you know, um, with men. But again, for me, the gender gap is almost equally parts, if not slightly more, the high, uh, the high support that Hispanic women have been giving to Democrats. The only thing that I'll add um, is uh, work that Stephanie Valencia did on the confidence gap that women have that I thought was really interesting, where, um, and there's such an opportunity to, to court Latinas um, because, you know, if Latinas are not 100% sure of the candidate that they're voting for and why they're voting for it, they would rather stay home than to actually kind of you know, vote for whoever and then regret it. So I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. that within this gender gap um, conversation, there is sort of that confidence gap that exists among Lat Latina women, um, which goes to show you, you know, the, the power to, to be able to tap into that if you can just educate them and give them the sort of resources that they need in order to make an educated guest on, on, on um, who they're gonna vote for and why. And this goes to the power of political outreach. This goes to the power of that mobilization of the education, voter education. All right, we only have about five minutes left. I'm going to apologize in advance to folks whose questions I didn't get to. Great questions. The conversation continues, you know, throughout these next couple of months. Um, one one um, attendee ask for your social media handles. We'll be sure to drop that in the chat so you can follow us, we'll keep engaging. But I, I wanna end in looking to the future, right? So we were 
able to do a postmortem of the 2020. But we're a year away from 2022, another set of midterm elections, which could be very interesting. And then 2024, Matt and Daniela, what are we likely to see in terms of ground game? And also, what are the, the, the weaknesses that the Democratic Party and in particular Biden needs to be on the lookout for? So, Daniela, I'll start with you. Yeah, and I think about, you know, how, you know, and Matt will know more about this because he did, he did a lot about this, but, you know, contextualizing Latinos based on region, age, nationality, the level of uh, assimilation to whiteness that they, that they have, um, the, the, the detachment to the immigrant experience. Like, I don't think you can have a conversation and integrate messaging to Latinos without considering all those factors. I mean, it's just, it, and, and also I don't think, I don't think it's going to be enough to say um, the next election cycle, you know, anybody but. I think that for, mm -hmm. for this election cycle, it worked for a lot of maybe um, more moderate Republicans, um, maybe more socially liberal uh, Latinos who, whose, whose idea of like, okay, I, I'll vote for Biden because I don't want Trump. Like that's not going to work going forward. So the strategy is going to have to be a lot more robust than that. And I think misinformation, like what, what's, what, I, who does that fall onto, and and how are they going to combat that? Because misinformation in the Latino community was really rampant. Um, so looking how how uh, campaigns are going to tackle that is going to be really important, um, and just sort of understanding the fragility of, of the Biden campaign and, and, and understanding, you know, how to met, how to target Latinos in a way that is not monolithic, um, understanding that immigration is not the top issue, but that that, that um, sort of sense of aspiration and inspiration that that messaging brings, right? Because we can all relate to the immigrant experience, but that doesn't mean that we are, you know, it's our number one issue, but using messaging that our community sees as aspirational and inspirational, and then, you know, bringing in the agenda um, for, for whatever candidate. So, I have a lot of thoughts. I don't know if that was very coherent, but I just feel like, um, and, and I think it's an opportunity too, because, you know, the GOP party is still very much fragmented now. Like we are, we're in this year, we're trying to figure out like, what is the party going to look like? And so I think that in itself is a really big opportunity for Democrats to sort of um, give uh, more moderate Latinos an opportunity for an alternative, but they have to start early. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the most important thing that we need to work on on the Democratic side is the disinformation and misinformation that Daniela brought up. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to um, attack that. Uh, people are so ingrained in some of those circles that it is a very, very difficult fight when people say, well, why didn't you say this? Why didn't you say, we were saying all of those things. I mean, these are really difficult uh, and you have to play dirty to counter them because they're just straight lying. And um, so that's a difficult thing. We need more research on the best ways to break that down and to get through because that will continue. That is not a one-off, a two-off. That is going to be the new strategy for sure. I do think that we need to, to think about uh, the other point Daniela uh, brought out, which is that the Republicans are, are still trying to figure out their own political future. Are they going to continue on the Trump path of really sort of xenophobic nationalist uh, and trying to figure out which Latinos possibly fit into that? Or are they gonna come back on a more um, George W. Bush or Jeb Bush uh, path, John McCain path that was looking to a more inclusive America? That is a fight that's happening in the Republican party. So I'm gonna be finding out and watching what that's going on there. And I think Democrats need to just continue, as I said earlier, continue talking continue talking in that populist voice about how they understand and can relate to and want to lift up that sort of everyday person's experience. And, and that will be the best way to continue uh, to make those breakthroughs. But the growth will continue. I'll end you on my last, uh, what I started with. The growth will continue. Uh, it's gonna continue, especially in states like Texas, 
Uh, and so you'll have to let us know when that Texas panel is, because I'll be in the audience on that one. I want to <laughs> listen and see what's happening because it's a state I'm watching very closely. And I think um, it is going in the direction uh, for people who have been working hard here. It is going in that direction and the growth is continuing. Thanks, Matt. So final thoughts here. I think it's, it's inspiration and aspiration. I think this is something both Democrats and Republicans have always understood from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama, that it's about a message that relates to people, that relates to the strong <laughs> Latino population. You have to have something that brings them in. With that, I am going to sign off. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Matt, Daniela, un placer. I wish you were here in Austin, Texas with me, but the conversation will continue. There will be a lot to continue unpacking in 2022, 2024. Um, with that, I bid you all a good night. Gracias. Thanks so much. Thank you.